First reading tonight is from Psalm 32. If you've got one of the Bibles on the seats, it's on page 560. Psalm 32 and verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together as we remain standing. Father, that would be our delight this evening to praise you more, the God who has saved us. To that end, we cry out for understanding We pray that we will be able to look at these words that the Spirit inspired and that he would illuminate them in our minds. Father, we know that you're the God who speaks, and we pray that in this moment you would speak to people this evening. We pray for those who have gathered, who have no understanding yet of what Jesus Christ offers, and we pray that tonight will be a night when the eyes are open. We pray for young people gathered here who have yet to grasp who the Lord Jesus Christ is, and the forgiveness of sins that is available in him. We pray tonight will be a night they grasp it. We pray for ourselves as the people of God, and we pray that we would not be like the horse or the mule. We pray, Lord, that we would be humble and listen and obey for the glory of Christ. Amen. Do please be seated. I find it helpful to have a Bible open, Psalm 32. If you've got one of the, the Bibles in the seats, it's page 560. Have you ever wondered why Christians confess their sins to the God that they love. Is that an odd practice to you? Depending on your view of religion, that particular practice of confession may not seem strange at all. For example, if your view of religion is that the real purpose of life is to get to the heavenly gates, amassing as many good deeds as you can, then regular confession will fit in and that will be an obvious thing to do. Ongoing sin surely must require ongoing forgiveness. And what better way to receive that valuable pronouncement from heaven than to say sorry to God, the God you have offended. So if that is your view of religion, then it would make sense that confession is what you do. However, just suppose that you have spent a good amount of time examining what the Bible has to say. 
the heart of the Bible's message. So you've not been convinced just to rely on what your friends have said, uh, what the culture around you says, maybe not even what your parents have said to you. But you, you've gone into the Bible, you've examined the heart of the message, and what have you discovered? Well, in the words of Romans chapter 8, verse 1, you've been stopped in your tracks by the eternity-shaking, shocking message that is summarized there. Now, what is that message? The heart of the gospel, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you get that? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not a little bit that we have to pay off, but there is now no condemnation for those who have faith in Jesus Christ. There is nothing to fear, nothing to fear, because Jesus Christ has paid for all the sins of his followers, the sins that they had committed previously, the sins that they are, uh, sins they are committing now, and indeed the sins that they are still to commit. When someone has faith in Jesus Christ, they are united to him, and so we receive the forgiveness for everything we will ever do. Now, if that's your understanding, then it would seem very logical to ask the question that I have about confession. Why do we bother? Why do we bother to confess our sins? If Christ has paid for them all, and he has... And if Christ has forgiven them all, and he has, then why still confess them? What you cannot say is that this practice of confession is simply mistaken church tradition, and so therefore we should just get rid of it. If that's all it was, then that's what we should do. But we can't do that. Why not? Why can't we simply say to Shirley, our administrator, that when she comes to do the service sheets, you know, when you get to... When you get to the confession, surely next time, just save a bit of space. You can save the planet. Now, why do we need such a thing? It's just tradition where well, we can't say that. Remember 1 John chapter 1, we had it as our second reading. Uh, the expectation is that genuine children of God will be practicing confession. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. And the next verse, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from our unrighteousness. That is the expectation. We say the Lord's Prayer. What's the line? Maybe you say it so often you don't even remember it. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Now, how are we to understand? Did you see, did you see the dilemma? Did you see the force of it? How are we to make sense of the twin Bible truths? that at the same time, simultaneously, we are assured there is no condemnation at all for those in Christ Jesus, and yet we are expected to confess our sins on a regular basis. Well, that's the question we're going to answer tonight as we focus on Psalm 32. Uh, and what I want to show you is that, in fact, there are two different aspects of forgiveness. Now, you see those on your handout, uh, what is often called judicial forgiveness, at the focus of verses 1 and 2, and then parental forgiveness at verses 3 to 10. Uh, first of all, let's focus on what has been called judicial forgiveness in verse 1. Uh, we are told, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Now, the word blessed means to be highly favored. It's also got a link with happiness, but once you understand the position of being highly favored, that then leads to happiness, to joy. But it's about status. It's about being recognized as highly favored by God. And you notice, twice. <laughs> it's mentioned twice in these opening verses to stress that the people who meet these conditions are the ones who have really made it in life. Now, our world loves lists of people, doesn't it? It loves to parade lists of successful people. It loves to show us these are the ones who have made it in life. And we love to look at them. Now, the truth is that we don't all look at the same lists. We don't all envy the same people. For some of us, the, the list is the powerful ones. And we look at those the world says, these are the ones who have power in the world, and we envy them. We think, that's the list I would be on. For others, well, it means nothing. 
For some, the, the list is different. For some, it's the list of rich people, maybe the list of beautiful people, or the talented people, or maybe the thinnest people. I don't know. Fill in the blank. And then you read the first two verses of Psalm 32. And we are presented with the people who are truly blessed. We are presented with the ones who are highly favored. At the beginning of Psalm 32, God says, in the world, these are the ones who have made it. And who are they? The ones whose transgressions are forgiven. The ones whose sins are covered. The ones whose iniquities, it's the word it should be translated as. If you've got an ESV, that's what it says. The iniquities, the Lord does not count against them. Now, it's worth just pausing here. Three deliberate different words are used to describe our sinful condition. And taken together, what you see is that they offer a really comprehensive picture of the different ways that you and I choose to sin. Transgressions. What are those? A transgression is a deliberate, premeditated act of rebellion against God. Deliberate, focused, premeditated rebellion against God. Think of all those. You go to those, um, visit those stately homes maybe. Maybe you went to one of those uh, particular colleges or universities where they had the little signs up that says, keep off the grass. Maybe you've even got one at home. I don't know how good your grass is. Do you know what the signs I mean? And you see it. Let me tell you what transgression is. You see the sign and you say to yourself, I think I'll be there. I see it, I see the authority, I see the order, but tonight, today, I will be stepping over because I want to feel that spongy grass beneath my feet. It's deliberate. It's an act of rebellion. Now, of course, it's, it's much more serious when we come to God. But we do it, don't we? Our society does it. We do it with God's revealed instructions. We deliberately step over the line that he is drawn as an act of rebellion against his right to rule us. That's a transgression. And not surprisingly, when we do it, it rouses the anger of God justifiably. Sin. It's the second word to describe our behavior. It's got this idea of missing the mark. Now, you may have heard an illustration that, that goes something like this. a bit like you're trying to aim at a, at a target and, you know, you pull back and the, the, the arrow goes, but, 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 you, but you try your best, but you've kind of missed the target. You've missed the mark. Well, the word sin, of course, has this idea of missing the mark, but I really don't like that illustration. Because the illustration has, it, has in your head that it, you're really trying the hardest you can to, to meet the standard, but you just can't make it. Don't think that. Let me give you a better illustration. Think of an athlete who, who's, trying, who's trying to make the Olympic Games. Okay, and it comes, comes up to the day uh, well, they, well, they have their competition to see who's in the, in the team. And they miss out. They miss the standards. And why do they miss out on the standards? Because this is the guy's training regime for the last two years. Every day he gets up in the morning, he gets in his car, he drives to McDonald's, and he has a breakfast. And then he goes to bed. That's his regime. Every day for two years. Okay, now when he gets to the day of the trials, is he going to miss the mark? Definitely. He's going to miss the mark. He's going to miss the standards to get in. Why? Not because he's been trying really hard to make it, but because all the deliberate choices that he has made now mean that he's missed the mark. That's a better illustration. We miss the mark of God's standards because of the choices that we make. The third word, iniquities, uh, translated as sin again in your Bibles. What's the, what's the difference? These are, these are more the unplanned sins that we still choose to commit, so we are responsible, that come out of our sinful nature. Uh, so th- they're not the kind of premeditated rebellion. Uh, we're still responsible, but they're more unplanned during the day. You know the ones I mean? This is pretty common, isn't it? I, I don't wake up in the morning and decide that today is the day that I'm going to say hurtful things to my wife, and I'm going to shout at my kids. I don't, I don't get up with it. That's not, not in my to-do list. But some days I do that. I'm responsible for it. Those are my iniquities. It's not a pretty picture, is it? But it's a really comprehensive picture. Transgressions, sins, iniquities. 
But as I, I read it, do you know, I think what, what a perfect diagnosis of my life. Does that not just nail you? <laughs> uh, there are many reasons I could tell you why the Bible is true. But one of the reasons that convinces me that this book is absolutely from God is that it reads my life. <laughs> it just nails me. It gets me. It makes me understand myself. It makes me understand the world. You read that, do you know, does that not make sense to you? You may have grown up in a world where, where people tell you you're, you're morally neutral, but then you look at the decisions and things you do in your life, and that doesn't square up. But you read this understanding of your life, and it makes sense of the decisions that you do. I bet it makes sense of you. I know it makes sense of you, because the Bible says it is you. But is there any hope? Is there a hope? for a person like this? Is there a hope for me? Is there a hope for you? Is there a hope, a future for a rebel who has angered the king? Is there any hope for a sinner who has missed the mark? You know, it'd be okay if it ended there. It would read us, but it wouldn't be very positive. You know what Psalm 32 says? Yes, there is. Because what does it say? It says that transgressions can be forgiven. It reveals that sins can be covered. It declares that the Lord does not always count our sin against us. And notice again, the three different word pictures. There's a, there's a kind of parallel, isn't there? God is saying in the general, look, you have sinned in this comprehensive way. My salvation will be comprehensive. I'll deal with it all. But let's look at them individually. Transgressions can be forgiven. The, the sense behind this word forgiven is, is of a heavy load that is lifted off of us. So sometimes the guilt that you experience because of the transgressions that you have done, it weighs down on you when the Spirit convicts you. And friends, you do not have the shoulders to bear the weight of that guilt. Indeed, you do not have the shoulders to bear the punishment that we deserve that presses upon us. But God can take it away. And if tonight you are listening to this and you feel the weight of guilt, you feel the punishment that you deserve and it weighs you down and you think, where is the escape? Listen to these words. Transgressions can be forgiven. They can be lifted. God is able to rid them. Sins can be covered. The idea here is that our sins can be removed from sight, never to be seen, gone. That doesn't say here how. How is it possible for sins to be gone? How is it possible for a God who is just to get rid of them? Now the Bible is going to say it's about Jesus Christ, but they can be gone, removed. Iniquities are not counted against us. This is a, this is a banking term. You imagine that you've got a spiritual account that records the punishment we deserve every time we sin, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. The punishment increases. It's counted against us. And yet here, somehow, it doesn't have to be that way. That our iniquities are not counted against us. Not in the account. And you think, how? How is that possible? And of course, the Bible will say Jesus Christ. Now, let me say to you that if, if these statements are not true of an individual then whatever they say, whatever list they appear on, they have not made a success of their life. You consider the person who is rich, but who is unforgiven. They will go to hell. You consider the person who has the most loving family and the brightest career, but whose sins are not covered up, then they will suffer in hell. You consider the person who is beautiful but whose sins are counted against them and for all eternity they will suffer in hell. Consider whatever list you like and if the people in the list cannot be described using the opening words of Psalm 32 that they are not the blessed ones. These are the blessed ones. And the question therefore becomes this. When is it appropriate to apply that language to people? Okay? Okay. When can you do it? Surely you say it's for the Christian, but at what point in a Christian's life can those words of Psalm 32 be applied to them? At the start of the Christian life? 
in the middle of the Christian life or only at the end of the Christian life? When can you say that? Do you know something? These verses are quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 4. He's just been dealing with how it is that the, the God who is just can justify those who are unrighteous, who can call them righteous, glorious words. And then he gets into chapter 4, and he's describing justification by faith alone, how we can be declared to be in the clear with God, and it happens when we have faith in Jesus Christ. And you know something? He quotes these words from Psalm 32. Paul was saying with his apostolic authority that as soon as we become Christians, these verses can be, should be applied to us. <laughs> Not at the end of your Christian life, at the start when you've got faith in Jesus Christ. And friends, that is called judicial forgiveness. Uh, it is called that because the scene you are to imagine when you become a Christian is the heavenly courtroom. You would imagine yourself standing in the dark before your divine judge, the holy God that you have rightly, well, you have offended and who is now rightly angry because of our treasonous crimes, and you know you are guilty. And what happens? That glorious judge looks at you in the eye and you hear his words that says, I forgive you. I forgive you. And what he means is that all of your sins, past, present, and future, have been fully paid for by Jesus Christ. It is a declaration that you receive at that point of your conversion, and therefore you are the blessed ones. And that judicial forgiveness remains constant throughout your Christian life. It's glorious, isn't it? <laughs> now, are you sitting here tonight and you have never, ever trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation? If not... Do it. Seriously, do it. Don't misunderstand religion. Put your trust in Jesus and do it tonight. Seriously, if you know enough, don't delay it. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Ask him tonight and you will be in that list. The blessed ones. And if yes, do we understand and do we realize that all our sins have been dealt with? Not just the socially acceptable sins. Do you have that as a Christian? I think sometimes we operate with, with kind of two circles. Uh, we've got the, 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 the kind of the, the inner circle of what we would consider our acceptable sins to do, and those can be forgiven by Jesus Christ. But there's another outer circle, and if you're in those kind of sin lists, well, it doesn't count. Rubbish! All your sins have been paid for. If you've come to Christ recently and you've carried so much from your past and you think that Jesus Christ can only forgive some of what you've done, rubbish. He's forgiven everything. And do we operate in the world with the understanding that we are the blessed ones? Do you get up in the morning and that's what you see in the mirror? You're the blessed one if you've got faith in Jesus Christ. Whatever the world says about you, however the world makes you feel about yourself, God says, you are blessed. So get up in the morning and live like it. You and me have judicial forgiveness. What about, what about parental forgiveness? And that's what we move on to discover in verses three to 10. When you become a Christian, you are adopted into the family of God. Jesus Christ becomes your older brother uh, and we become the adopted sons and daughters of God. We're in the family. And therefore, we do not simply relate to God as judge. We relate to God as our father. And if you just think about the best human fathers, uh, the ones who love their children extravagantly, the ones who love their children unconditionally, and you ask yourself this question, do those wonderful fathers ever get angry at their children? Yes. Don't they? Yes. Of course they do, because their children sometimes do things that offend them, and they expect their children to say sorry. And what the father should say when their child comes and says sorry is not, it doesn't matter. It does matter. They should say, I forgive you. But until that time, they will discipline their children in some way. They will never exclude the child from their presence forever, but the relationship will not be the same. Now, something similar happens when we sin 
as the children of God. Our judicial standing remains unchanged, okay? You get that? Remains unchanged. But our fellowship with God is affected. You see, there are consequences experientially when we sin. Therefore, it is right for us to say sorry to God and ask our Heavenly Father to forgive us. Now, get the clear. At this point, when we as Christians ask for forgiveness, we are not asking for judicial forgiveness. We have that. We're not asking for that. You've got that already. You are asking for parental forgiveness. We're not asking God to let go of our punishment. He's done that. We're asking him to restore his sweet fellowship in our lives. And that is what I think David describes in these next few verses. Uh, What happened before he asked for parental forgiveness and then what happened after he asked uh, for parental forgiveness. Look at what happened uh, before, verse three. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. See what's happening? There's a time, and he's a believer, but he's not confessing his sin to God, and it has a physical impact on his body. David says, your hand, God's hand, my Lord's hand was heavy upon me. That is, God was giving him over to his troubled conscience. Now, why did God do that? Why didn't God make him feel good? Because God loved him. Do you ever feel like that? Other things in your life, you're a believer. And to be honest, there are things that you are doing, secret sins known only to you or a few others. You're doing them, you know they're wrong, they are wrong, they're sins. Maybe Maybe the habits are so ingrained now that you become addicted and enslaved to them, but but you're miserable. You really are miserable. You can't even bring yourself now to put that that surface smile on. You're just miserable. Sometimes you might even find yourself asking, if God loved me, why would he allow me to feel like this? Let me tell you why he's allowing you to feel like that. Because he loves you. If it's about unconfessed sin, why? Because he loves you enough that he wants you to return to him. He doesn't want you to be happy in your sinfulness. He wants you to be so unhappy that you'll wake up and come back to him. He wants you to confess your sin and ask for his parental forgiveness. And look what happens to David once he owns up, once he confesses. Verse five, oh then, what a glorious change, then. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Instead of God's heavy hand, it's his light touch, isn't it? The guilt he felt was lifted from him. The sweet fellowship was restored. There was liberation when he told God what God already knew. Now, if you were to ask David, Okay, David, I get that. That's what happened to you. But but what's in it for me? What do you want me to do with this truth? I understand it now, but what do I do with it? Well, I think the answer is obvious, isn't it? In fact, he writes it down. Verse six, therefore, see the link? This is what's happened to David, my real personal experience. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. The God of grace is waiting for his children to come and pray. He's talking to believers, isn't he? He's not asking unbelievers to to repent, to be converted. He's asking believers to confess their sins because he wants them to experience the same liberation that he has. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on because the fellowship that God wants for his children is not simply for them to be reconciled. God now wants to teach them. And that's the voice, I think, of verses eight and nine. Verse eight, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Who's speaking in verse eight? I think it's the Lord. That you is singular. He's he's addressing the one who has confessed to sin and God himself is saying, I will instruct you now 
It's parental language, isn't it? I will teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. What a lovely picture of the Lord wanting his children to now walk in his ways. That's what God wants for us, to have fellowship as we walk with him. He'll he'll give us the boundaries. He will show us the desires of the family. And then do you know what he says to his children? I now want you to grow up within the boundaries and make some choices. It's so liberating. As a child of God, you don't have to be going around all the time going, oh, does God want me to do that? He he hasn't said in the Bible. I, I can't, he hasn't given me a detailed plan of my life. I know that. He wants you to mature. Make some calls on this. He's giving you some great boundaries. He's in sovereign control of everything. He now wants you to walk and step with the Spirit and grow. But how we respond to the Lord's instructions are crucial. What are we warned about? Verse 9 Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the the woes of the wicked. You walk away from the Lord and his ways, and there are woes, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. That's it, isn't it? That the Lord's love surrounding, keeping us as his children. Therefore, we trust and walk in his ways. But what is our choice? Well, do not be like the horse or the mule. Because, because what is characteristic of the horse and the mule? They are stubborn and stupid. Now, we don't call it that, do we? We don't like to say we're stubborn and stupid. We like to, we like to rename it. We, we like to say we are free-thinking and open-minded. That sounds better, doesn't it? <laughs> but let's just call it for what it is. What is it? Eat or That's what it is. Stubbornness, stupidity. When God has revealed his way and wants us to walk in it, let's stop saying things are interesting and do nothing about it. Let's walk in the ways of the Lord and trust that his love will surround us. Christian, your heavenly father can control you by circumstances. He can. But he would rather convince you through his word. So after we've confessed our sins and felt the Holy Spirit lifting the burdens from our shoulders, and this is a reality, friends, let's resolve to listen to the tender voice of our Father. Now, one more thing, just one more thing to say before we finish. It's what we're told in verse 11. We've had uh, judicial forgiveness. uh, We've had parental forgiveness. uh, And it, it all ends here with this commandment, joyful forgiveness. Verse 11, rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing. All you are upright in heart. Okay, there's a commandment. Has ever, have you ever had this experience where you're really feeling miserable and someone comes along to you and says, cheer up. If you've had that experience, what are you thinking at that moment? In your heart, you don't want to say to them, of course, cheer up. Love it. Thanks for that. I didn't think of that. When someone normally says that, you, you, your first response might be, let me tell you about a deep joy down in my heart that you know nothing about. <laughs> it's really deep. In fact, it's so deep, I don't even know where it is. Or you might just want to hit them. But, but recognize what this is. This is a command to rejoice. This is a command to sing. And it doesn't come from me, it comes from God. This is God commanding his people to be joyful. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I quote, what a gracious God we serve who makes delight to be a duty and who commands us to rejoice. Let me read that again. What a gracious God we serve who makes delight to be a duty and commands us to rejoice. It is our, ju- our duty to delight in God. When you don't feel like it, it matters not. It is our duty to delight in God. And why is that a gracious thing for God to do? Because God has your joy in his heart. And so therefore, when you don't want to do it, God wants your joy, and therefore he commands you to do it. And the question is, how do we do it? How do we obey the commandment? Recognize, friends, verse 11 doesn't 
doesn't stand on its own. It's not a psalm of its own. It's not Psalm 32b. It's at the end. So what have we discovered so far? Well, you don't obey this command simply to tell yourself to rejoice more and more. It is remembering what we have already been told. So as we remember and understand and appreciate judicial forgiveness, as we gaze at that glorious truth, and therefore we must gaze at Jesus Christ, as we do that, the Spirit will give us joy. And as we make sure we understand and practice confession and therefore experience parental forgiveness, then the Spirit will give us joy. You see what happened here? It's not just an intellectual thing. It's part of that, but it moves into the experiential. So what, what do we do this week? Let us pray. Pray for that ability to consider the cross. We understand judicial forgiveness and the humility to confess our sins and experience a fresh parental forgiveness. And I'll tell you something if you do that. Your joy in God will increase. Let's pray. Father, we pray for any tonight who have been convicted by your spirit of their sins that need forgiveness. We pray tonight will be the night that you would draw some in this very building to put their trust in Jesus. Father, we delight in the many who are gathered here who do trust in your son. We pray that this week you would show us afresh what judicial forgiveness means as we gaze at the cross and help us, Father, to have that humility to confess our sins. And so we pray experientially that this week we would experience parental forgiveness. Increase our joy, we pray, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen.